and I'd like to welcome everyone to a final coffee afternoon of the year. Um, hope, hopefully you've had a good year and I will hand over to Matt to take a look back across the last year and reflect on, on the first conversations we had at the start of 2021 in January and his review of, of the year. Awesome. Thank you, Will. Well, it's great that we're in December. We've had a wonderful year. You know, we reflect back at the start of the year when COVID was, uh, you know, huge and was just impacting on everything we do. But as we've moved throughout the year, things have improved and we've got better. And thankfully, we've come out of the other side of it now. Well, that, that was what I was hoping to write anyway and, and, and present, but it seems that hasn't quite been the case and the ground continues to uh, shift under our feet. So for those of you that were with us back in January, we did a bit of a, a fortune telling session where we looked at what we thought might happen across the course of the year and, uh, and had a, a fairly open conversation about that. And so what I wanted to do today was really start our uh, uh, panel discussion and conversation just by looking back on some of those um, predictions and just I guess kind of sharing my thoughts on what has happened so if this allows me to move my slide forward that would be good if it doesn't um, we're in a little bit of trouble I can't remember how to do this da, da, da. there we go excellent so um, these were the, uh, the five things that we uh, talked about and it's quite, you know will covid result in more volunteering in the long term well we're still um, in the midst of a pandemic um obviously with omicron things um seem to be getting more challenging by the day and i think it's very difficult for us to um assess whether or not anything uh, any of the practices that we, we talked about in that initial session were around um, you know what could we learn from um from the, the the vaccination project you know we just not had the opportunity to apply that to any of our practices and uh, certainly the case at the at the moment where i'm working with my team across the group to look at options that include shutting down our volunteer programs again in the future um, if we go into another lockdown the second thing that we uh, explored was, will our ethical compass be spun to breaking point? And this was really in the light of the fact that we were starting to see a number of redundancies being made across the sector, very sadly. And uh, we were asking ourselves whether or not um, we thought we would be put in positions where we were asking uh, volunteers to potentially backfill those posts or to take on more responsibility. And how might we, as volunteer engagement professionals, navigate that um, those 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 tricky conversations um, and therefore would our ethical compass be spun to breaking point um, and I'm not going to answer these questions now because I think they do lead nicely into a, an open conversation the third area was uh, will virtual volunteering take its place as the future of volunteering and so would we see uh, new online volunteering roles come into play and at a far greater and faster rate than we've, we've seen before would we see you know online tours uh, happening collections based roles you know, all of those things that perhaps we've talked about as uh, volunteer managers uh, over the years would we see those actually coming to pass the fourth area was, uh, will Black Lives Matter lead to meaningful change in volunteering? Will we see um, not only greater thought given to equality, diversity and inclusion, but would we see meaningful action take place? And then lastly, can we be the leaders our organisations need us to be? Could we lead our volunteer programmes and our organisations through uh, the difficult times that we are facing? Do we have the skills that we need as volunteer engagement professionals to lead those conversations? Would we be able to support colleagues with, with difficult decisions around some of the areas that are in there, around, you know, ethical decision making around volunteering? So they were the, uh, the five things that we uh, explored. And, and, and what I hope is that we were now able to use those as a platform to uh, a panel discussion, which uh, Will is kindly going to chair uh, for us. So I'll, um, I'll hand back over to, uh, to Will and I'll uh, stop sharing my uh, screen and, um, and we'll take things from there, I think, won't we, Will? Yes, yes, we'll uh, carry on into our panel discussion, which is um, on this theme, exploring um, 2021 and a little look forward to 2022. So I'm delighted to, alongside Matt, to welcome Rob Jackson and Rhiannon Green to um, 
share with us their perspectives on the year. So I'll, I'll start with you, Matt. Um, how, what, what do you think has been the sort of most significant thing we learned about volunteering this year? Ooh, that's a, that's a, an interesting uh, question to get the uh, the ball rolling. I knew I should have had a, uh, a coffee instead of a herbal tea, but never mind. <laughs> um, what is the most significant? I, I the importance of volunteers. Actually, I will say, and I'll say that outside, you know, outside of the the heritage sector, if we look at the impact that volunteers have made um, on the vaccination program, and will need to make in order for the um, uh, for the for the government's ambitions around the booster jab to be successful, then I think that that is perhaps the most important thing we've seen. And I think we do need to reflect on what that means for us as volunteer engagement professionals within the the heritage sector, because we often talk and I know Rob you, you talk, talk far more eloquently than me about this but actually about volunteers um, you know doing support roles um, but not doing critical tasks and the reality is that actually in the current scenario if volunteers don't support the booster vaccination program and do critical work then it isn't going to be successful and the country is going to be in a very difficult position and of course it's not just um, the vaccination program where we see volunteers um, doing socially critical roles you know my little boy's in beavers and actually if that's entirely volunteer run and if there's no volunteers then there's no beavers and that doesn't happen and there's so many um uh, ways in which kind of volunteer deliver critical and crucial activities um across the country of which the booster program and the vaccination program is perhaps the most most obvious i, I think that has been you know and it has brought that topic into to stark relief for us and I, I will pass over to Rob who can articulate all of that far better than, than I can. <laughs> Three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon in the last week of work before <laughs> Christmas, thanks Matt. Um, You're welcome mate. Uh, I think as far as the main learning for me and I've spoken about this I think on coffee mornings before, um, the, the biggest learning for me came when that, the, that community life survey data was published in the summer because up until that came out in what was it June, July time, the prevailing narrative since the start of the pandemic has been one of millions of people volunteering, many for the first time, and what's been latched onto by many people in the sector, not necessarily volunteer management people, but by many people in the sector is, this is great because it means there's millions of people just sat there waiting to be asked to come forward and volunteer when all of this is over. And I think the data that came out, the Community Life Survey, gave a bit of a bit of a question to the validity and the reliability of that, not least of which that even if we just take informal volunteering, which I think we can all acknowledge did see a boom during 2020, the boom that we saw really was no bigger than, well, statistically, the numbers were much lower than they were in 2013-14. So we're probably not in the healthy position that many people who don't really understand volunteering and many people in the media think we're in. And I think, I think the reason why that's important is partly, hopefully, it tempers some of that unrealistic expectation of volunteering in the future. But also, I think it's good statistical ammunition for us to push back against uh, where we may be facing pressure from uh, boards or managers to meet unrealistic expectations about volunteering. And I've just put out some stuff on social media this afternoon that I wrote a piece back in June about how, for me, one of the biggest shames so far or up until that point is that we, we haven't really learned anything from the 300,000 people who were given nothing to do under the NHS Volunteer Responder Programme. And of course, here we are almost six months later on where we desperately need those 300,000 people to step up so that, as Boris puts it, we can all get boosted. But whilst we've been quick to learn the positive stuff and share the positive stuff, we seem to have been very slow to learn the kind of negative stuff. So partly because we've been so fixated on that kind of hyperbolic, uh, overly positive narrative about volunteering. So for me, that that kind of sense of a bit more grounding, a bit more real life experience that recognizes the contribution that many people on this call and many volunteer managers up and down the country have been making and and really puts into perspective the reality of what we're all facing going forward was a was a big learning point rob do you think there's a there's a challenge because there is that 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 
very strong narrative, which I think has, has waned a little bit over the past few months about this kind of sheer volume of people that we as volunteer managers are going to be essentially put in a position whereby chief execs are saying, well, actually, there are, there's, there's all these people out there wanting to volunteer. Go and get them well, to volunteer with us. I can remember a conversation with a member of Heritage Volunteering Group whose name will remain unmentioned on the purpose of on, the, on this call, who was saying, I think it was in the summer of 2020, that their trustees had been saying to them that they were never going to have a problem recruiting a volunteer ever again. Um, just literally just needed to click their fingers and the volunteers would come forth in the mass multitudes to volunteer without any question. And uh, I don't think anybody with any grounding in the experience of the last two years would say, indeed, Ben, would say anything other than Ben's just said in the chat, which is lol. Um, it's just not the reality for people. And, and I, you know, the, the kind of thing that maybe we all live and breathe in our work is not the stuff that our chief execs, our executive directors, our boards necessarily read and understand, which is the same reason why many of the conversations we were having before the pandemic about the need for change and the stuff HVG's promoted about the need for volunteering strategies is the narrative that we all have between us, but isn't necessarily the narrative that other people in the organisations we work in have. I think it's so important, that, you know, coming back to that, that, that point of conversation from the start of the year about us being leaders within the organisation and having that information and data to be able to make a compelling argument or a counter argument in this case to say actually these people they're not just stood outside our door waiting to come inside you know, you know and, and being able to, to have that in a, in a kind of a meaningful way is, is so important. Yeah absolutely. Amazing. I also think let's not forget that like a crisis really galvanises people um, and actually, you know, that humanitarian cause really brought people together. And um, even from the perspective of ZSL, um, we put out a campaign to say that we were in dire straits and the animals might all die and people flocked in. But we can't keep saying that because um, it will be all, all its impact. <laughs> so, you know, I think there is something about, you know, it was a very extraordinary time as well. I think the things that I've learned a lot about and. Um, I think Rob has um, said a lot about this in the past, but I really saw the need for flexibility. Um, so we've talked about it academically many, many times over, but I think I really saw that over the last 18 months. And it's really interesting because some of our longer standing volunteers where I work and are trying to push us back into the rigid structures we had previously, because that's what they prefer, but actually, in terms of diversity, we've never been more diverse than we are now because we brought in a level of flexibility. So for me, that's been really um, visibly obvious. Um, and yes, the other point was that point about we need to manage expectations from the organisations about how quickly you can galvanise and get volunteers started because we as an organisation are now having to retrospectively fill the gaps in from having galvanised people so quickly at points last year so that they feel supported and um, equipped to do the role in less of a crisis period. I think it's great that you, you touch on that point there, uh, Rhiannon, about um, uh, flexibility, what we could learn from the, the pandemic, the crisis, and how we could take some of that learning and actually having broader benefits in the case of flexibility and, and supporting diversity and inclusion. And I, I do think that's so important. And, and it was something that we, we touched on earlier in the year about actually, you know, people wanting to help and wanting to help immediately. I mean, that's something that we can learn from because we don't need to be putting or we shouldn't be putting people through two months of recruitment, welcome, induction, training people want to help our organizations and they, they want to help now they don't want to help in in two months time that flexibility that you talked talked about you're know, giving people the option to volunteer when suits them and i think that was one of the maybe the appealing things of the you know the good sum up and i know rob um, is, is not a big fan but it did offer that flexibility and that is something that we could we we, we you know we could le again learn from i agree with you completely i'm i'm Big fan of the Good Sam app, I thought, for the limited period of time that it was on my phone because I was one of the 300,000 that was given nothing to do. I thought the idea of just being able to, as a volunteer, I mean, just think anybody who's listening to this, 
that your volunteers have an app where they pick and choose when they are free to volunteer for you rather than you relying on them being available when you want them to be that's a massive shift for a lot of organizations and i think you know there are people who don't like the good sam app but i think the way that whole initiative was structured around that was absolutely fantastic and i the challenge i think for a lot of organizations is people who've had that positive experience which is the majority of the nhs volunteer responders when they want to volunteer in another organization and they're not given that level of control, how are they going to feel? How are our excuses going to land because we don't give that to them? The big, the only criticism I've ever had of that initiative is we've not learned the lessons. We've not learned. It's the only time I can ever remember that we've mobilized hundreds of thousands of people in a national emergency who for perfectly understandable reasons were then never given anything to do. And we've made every effort to learn what went well, but no effort to learn, as far as I can tell, from what went wrong. And now we need to learn those lessons, and it's almost like we should have done it six months, a year ago. Yeah, it's a, a lot of the issues um, which have come up through the year, we've seen um, retention of volunteers, that transition yeah. from COVID to post-COVID where volunteers' lives have changed. And instead of dealing with a volunteer leaving every so so many weeks, you suddenly have a, like a, all of them come at you at once the organization opens. We've seen volunteers perhaps um, become more, more powerful in terms of their, their, their understanding their relationship with you and be able to almost dictate their terms of volunteering more because of how, many, how important volunteering has become through a pandemic. And I was wondering, so, um, looking at those sort of things looking towards next year what of those issues do we really need to focus on first i'm going to go with rihanna first and then matt and then rob sort of looking at the the challenges we face next year based on the issues raised this year oh well i feel a bit like i'm starting again in another year the conversations i've had today are all kind of scenario based what happens if the government do x y and z again so i got a slight case of deja vu a bit, but um, for us, um, and, I, and obviously I, I can only say more operationally than the Matt and Rob, it's really um, picking ourselves back up after a year of just doing and being, and really investing again back into our volunteer strategy, our training programmes, um, and but always living and breathing those um, principles around flexibility and thinking about the ways that people now want to volunteer going forward. I think it's a really interesting one, though, because we have sort of two camps of volunteers where I am. One that just wants to go back to what it was before. It's comfortable. I know it. And uh, new volunteers who are like, no, no, I, I can't necessarily volunteer that way and therefore I'd be excluded. And you've got these two camps that sort of slightly jar with one another. And what we're doing at the moment is trying to find that happy, happy medium, which will actually allow them both to tailor it to what they want. And I think I think we're nearly there, but um, it is an interesting path to tread on. So, yes, so for us, it's, it's all about reinvesting back in the, the programme because we've done everything on a, uh, what's it, a, a, you know, a wing and a prayer this year, a little bit. It's, yeah, it's, it's really it sounds like we going into next year. It's about actually finding out what normal is and sort of getting everyone to sort of agree together what normal is and moving forward so that there is a standard practice. Matt, with um, the issues that we have raised in 2021, what one for you needs to be addressed next year? I, I, I think it's probably that, that final point in, in terms of. Um, us growing into leaders within our organizations and be able to steer our organization through what, what are still very difficult choppy waters we need to um, feel confident and, and lead the conversations that we're having across all those topics whether it's operational strategic social impact diversity and inclusion we need to feel empowered and confident to have those discussions in a really meaningful way because if we don't the conversation will just slip back to the conversations we were having pre-covid and, and the opportunities and i do think there are opportunities for us as uh, volunteer managers coming out of this um 
will just slip away and we'll be, you know, and we'll just be back in the same, you know, it's, it's th those volunteers that want everything to happen that Rhiannon's uh, just described it exactly the same way. They'll be the, you know, that, that's what will happen and we'll be in exactly the same position. So for me, it's about us growing as leaders, engaging with um, strategic content and thinking about how we, um, we plan long term, how we influence, um, all of those things so that we can build more diverse, more inclusive, more impactful volunteer programmes and that we can learn from um, what's happened over the last, I was going to say 12 months, but it's nearly <laughs> two years, isn't it? Um, yeah. Is that, is that uh, an issue that you think needs to be addressed, Rob? Is there, is there any others which need to be addressed next year? I, do, I suppose I'm going to take a step back from the specifics and, and I, I think predicting the future is a bit of a mugs game these days because we don't know what the reality is going to be. I, I can see a number of different kind of scenarios. I can see one where this is hopefully the last winter where we have to go through COVID with the severity that we're having to go through it. Please, God, everybody, fingers crossed. Um, and and next year might actually genuinely be a year of, of proper recovery. And I think it's important to remember that we are in a much better place professionally now than we were a year ago with that. Not only because we've had two years of experience under our belts of all of this, but you know there there are there well, there are no volunteer managers on furlough anymore. You know we're we're all those of us that are left. We are still at work. We've been going through all of this. I think if if it looks like things are going to take a, another downturn with COVID, certainly in the first part of the year, then I think there's there's a, a concern around kind of are we just going to have to try and find a way to get through another twelve months of this. And that shift becomes one into adapting to, you know, we're not going to go back to in-person anytime soon. Online is going to be the reality for the next, I don't know, five years. And then there's that transition point that we're going to have to kind of make around that as well. So it, it's just, it's too, particularly with this new variant and the uncertainty and, you know, Scotland have already put restrictions this afternoon, advisory ones on how much households are allowed to mix over Christmas, which probably means there'll be more restrictions coming in in England before too long it's just nigh on impossible to make any kind of big predictions but I do think whatever we face we are in a much stronger position we understand what this has meant for volunteering we understand what it's meant for our organizations much better than we did if we were having this conversation crystal ball gazing into 2021 and that's a good thing I, I, yes, I mean I, I'm just thinking obviously we've got a lot of kind of volunteer managers a lot of people on, on who are who are thinking, well, actually, all of this is great conversation, but what I'm really worried about is the fact that I've seen a 20% drop off in my volunteers, and actually I'm wondering how I'm going to uh, roster my information point. And I, and I think that's, you know, the, the long and short of it is, is you know, yeah. how do we respond to those uh, gaps in, uh, in, in in our volunteer programmes? And I think... Um, I think people will volunteer, but again, it, it comes back to that point earlier, doesn't it, about actually learning from what's happened over the last 12, 18 months and applying that in terms of flexibility, uh, you know, and I, and I would strongly urge everybody not to just think about, you know, going back to that old model, just engaging the civic core. You know, there are a lot of people out there who will support us and our organisations and, and actually let's, let's use this as an opportunity to think about how we engage different audiences through being more flexible and through different types of engagement, through partnership working, all of those things, we can we can plug that gap and we can bring new people into our museums, into museums full stop. But we just need to take the time, just used to use this time to reflect and, and make the most of it, I think. Yeah, just to sort of add to that, I, I strongly believe we're just in a bit of a volunteering dip across the board. Um, and actually, I think one of the interesting things that we've found is that the introduction of flexibility has meant that people don't want to come in as regularly. So my volunteer pool now needs to be much larger than it ever was before. So I feel the pinch in terms of um, their operational reliance on volunteers a little bit more, but also now needing more people to support that flexible model, which, you know, like you say, I'm not going to jump back into the old model anytime soon, but it's something we're watching very carefully because at the moment we don't have enough people to, to do what we'd like to do. So yeah, interesting times. 
And I think that's where having a strategy and a long term plan is, is really important and actually mapping out what resources you need in what roles. And actually some roles you may well need a really you, you might need a, a very structured role. And that's fine because that will work for some people. But other roles we'll have that you can build that flexibility in. There's the opportunity to then offer those roles across to different groups as and when you need it and give people the opportunity to move more freely between roles. And, and all of that, it needs that, that planning and, and thought. But if you get it right, then I think there's a huge opportunity for us. It's, it's a real um, opportunity for, um, for volunteering next year. And I think, as, as we said, to come out of that dip, my guest sort of bring up the panel discussion to a close. You've got one minute each, really, to sort of say one minute about one thing you're looking forward to next year. Uh, I'll go Rianne on first, and then Matt, and then Rob. You want me to go first. Um, <laughs> One thing I'm looking forward to next year. So we've just run um, an exhausting set of feedback workshops with our volunteers, very similar to Ruth was saying in the chat. Um, and we have so much data now to um, trundle through, but I have a development workshop booked in with my volunteer coordinators in January and the feedback will form the backbone of our next five years of strategy, really, obviously with some flex. Um, so I'm really excited about that because we can actually now start to think about proactive change rather than all the reactive stuff that we've been doing for the last 18 months. So I'm really excited about that session and kicking the year off and thinking proactively about it. Brilliant. Thanks. Matt? Um, well, uh, rather cheesily, I'm going to say looking forward to working with um, colleagues on HVG it's, it's an absolute it's always a highlight of my year and I'm really fortunate to be able to work with such uh, brilliant people we've got some amazing stuff um, planned for next year and you'll you'll hear about some of that hopefully in January February time um, I'll tease you all uh, our EDI working group uh, Tamsin just sent me something across this morning that was very very exciting uh, and we hope to, to launch next year so yeah I, it's, it's you know it's a real privilege to work work with everybody and to to get get the opportunity to work with all of you guys our members as well um it's one of the reasons i love my job so much so that's what i'm looking forward to and rob i am looking to looking forward to seeing all that pent-up potential and planning if that's not an alliterative sentence i don't know what is of the last two years actually being able to be uh kind of released and realized over the la over the next 12 months i am going on an optimistic hoping we're going to be in a good position come the spring with covid and i can't wait to see all the stuff that i know people on this call and others have been thinking about and planning for the last 18 months two years being actually put into practice and i think that's gonna be a really exciting time for volunteering Definitely. I think coming from my own perspective, seeing some of our hints as, as we've reopened this year in the autumn, we've seen, um, we saw that low with volunteers not coming back, not ready to come back, but we've seen a steady increase of new volunteers coming and people who've never engaged with a museum before starting to join us almost on a weekly basis during November and, and December. And hopefully with that potential next year, I think putting in place those plans, Put, making sure that you've got a long-term plan in place for your volunteering for how you're going to work to become more diverse and more representative of the communities you're within and ultimately have that network like HVG to support and feed into that and continue that reflection that ability to adapt and, and learn and uh, uh, bring in new elements to to your work there's a lot to look forward to in, in 2022 and I'm now going to bring to close the the panel discussion and I will shortly end the recording and we'll